Hi there, Matt Easton of Scholar Gladiatoria. So, I'm here to talk a little bit about Indian martial arts. I'm holding a pair of Indian swords in my hands, as you can see. Um, as many of you will know, I have uh, had through my hands, in other words, to uh, collect and buy and sell many, many Indian weapons over the years, and I've become quite familiar with them. Um, and m although my main focus is British military swords, my exact focus is actually um, British military swords used in India. Uh, that is both by British troops and Indian troops because they're all part of the same army. And um, I'm, I've become very interested in it over the years, both in the weapons themselves, but also obviously their use and the martial arts that they use. And I teach on a, a weekly basis, obviously I teach British military sabre. However, I also have friends who practice Indian martial arts and I'm very interested in the, um, the practice of Indian martial arts and the use of Indian weapons and the Indian weapons themselves. Now, something I've become aware of over the years and sort of frustrated by is a, and this is the main point of this video, is the uh, repeated claim by various Indian martial arts um, I have to say, particularly, this is a claim I've seen made by um, Shasta Vidya practitioners and also Kal Kalari Piatu um, practitioners, is that the British, under British rule, um, essentially banned the practice of martial arts in India. And obviously, those martial arts say they were, you know, Kalari Piatu claims that under British rule, Kalari Piatu was banned. Well, it just so happens that this is my main area of research, the practice of martial arts in 19th century India. And you know what? I've never found a single mention of any banning of martial arts in India. Even, even further than that, it seems that the British government pretty much encouraged the practice of martial arts in India. I'll explain a little bit more. So, it just so happens that one of my main areas of interest is the practice of swordsmanship in India and how British swordsmanship was influenced by Indian swordsmanship, if at all, and indeed how Indian martial arts were influenced by British martial arts, if at all. Now, without going into huge amounts of depth, what I will say is first off, I have dozens and dozens, no, probably hundreds of original 19th century sources taken from diverse, uh, diverse sources, from personal diaries, from newspapers, um, from published autobiographies, all sorts of things that talk about the practice of swordsmanship, both European style swordsmanship and Indian style swordsmanship, in India in the 19th century. And the headline, I would say, so far, based on my current level of research, is that, in actual fact, there wasn't a lot of cross-pollination between Indian swordsmanship and British swordsmanship. However, there was a little bit and the most visible, the most obvious area where certain things were brought over into the practice of swordsmanship in, in Britain, in fact, and in the British Army as a whole, all over the world, was the practice of what are called sword feats. Now, sword feats are what we would these days really call test cutting. And essentially it boils down to doing certain types of tricks with a sword. One of these, for example, was to um, cut a sheep in half at one blow. A dead sheep, you'll be happy to hear, a sheep carcass. Another one was to uh, cut ribbons of silk um, off from the edge of a blade. So you lay the ribbons of silk on the blade and then using a particular type of flick and drawing cut, you actually slice the ribbons just purely with the force of the drawing cut and the resistance of the air. Um, another trick is cutting the lemon or sometimes apple or sometimes orange on a person's hand without cutting their hand. Um, and another one is cutting an apple or some other fruit inside a silk handkerchief without cutting the silk handkerchief. So, to cut a long story short, there's actually quite a lot of um, swordsmanship in India which is spoken about in British sources. And in none of the British sources that I have ever read, do they ever suggest that any of this swordsmanship that was happening in 19th century India was in any way taboo or forbidden or banned or even just you know troublesome or anything there's nothing negative at all I have never yet found a British source from the 19th century suggesting that the practice of swordsmanship in India was in any way a negative thing and in contrary all of the sources pretty much that I have either talk about it just completely blasé like oh yeah we went to a village 
and there were some people practicing with sticks and bucklers. Which incidentally is what's done today in Gatka and was, as far as I can tell, over the entirety of India in the 19th century, the standard practice of swordsmanship. They would take a, a stick, sometimes, you know, rattan, bamboo, whatever, it doesn't matter, a stick, sometimes it was padded, um, sometimes they struck each other with contact and sometimes they didn't, and they took a buckler or a dal in their other hand and they fenced. Uh, and this is incidentally pretty much exactly what's described in English sources from the medieval period from the 15th century. Um, so it's pretty much the standard form of practicing in a society where sword and buckler is the typical combo. You take a stick, you take a buckler and you practice um, trying to hit or not hit each other. Um, and this was the standard form of swordsmanship practice in India in the 19th century. It's documented in dozens and dozens of sources. And uh, in many sources they just mention it like blasé, yep yeah, we went there, they were doing this, it was a feast day, there was lots of celebrating, they were, they were using Indian clubs, they were doing wrestling, um, they were doing juggling, and they did some fencing. Boom, and off we went. Nothing negative there at all. Or, it's mentioned in a completely positive term, and it's talking about the wonderful swordsmanship of the natives, i.e. the people of India. Um, uh, wherever it was in India, and this is the sources from all over the, the all over India. Whether you're talking about Madras or um, Bengal or the Punjab or wherever, you can find sources from all of those areas talking about this, and um, uh, and they very often talk about Indian swordsmanship and um, Indian martial arts as a whole, including wrestling, which was very big and remains very big in India, and is probably actually the biggest living lineage martial art in India. Um, and they talk about these things in very positive terms. And there are numerous authors at numerous different levels that talk about this thing. Um, there are, you know, British soldiers serving in the army. Um, there are in, indeed um, uh, kind of really high level, you're talking about like sort of royalty kind of people who see displays of Indian swordsmanship. That clearly it wasn't banned if, you know, if like the Prince of Wales is, is watching it. Um, and it's just crazy. I don't know where this really pervasive BS myth comes from uh, that the British banned the practice of traditional martial arts in India. I can't find a single source to support it. And not only that, all of the sources that I do have, which are numerous, actually suggest the complete opposite. That if anything, the British authorities kind of encouraged the practice of martial arts. Because remember that the majority of the British army soldiers in India were Indian, okay, they, uh, and, and you know, many of those were cavalrymen whose primary weapon was the sword, be it the toolbar in the irregu irregular cavalry, or the sabre in the regular cavalry, or lance in some cases. Um, so, very simply, they didn't want to wreck, they had this great force of, of, of fighting soldiers, fighting for the British Empire, why would they want to forbid them from practicing their traditional martial arts? And in fact, if we look at Louis Nolan's book on cavalry, um, you can see him explicitly stating in the 1850s there, just before the charge of the Light Brigade, just before he died, essentially, um, you can see him, ex and he was an experienced Indian cavalry officer. He had served as a British cavalry officer in India for many years. And you can see him explicitly stating that to teach the Indian cavalrymen the British sword exercise is pointless because they're already really good swordsmen and they already know what to do with their swords so just let them get on with it. Um, so there we go guys, I, 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 just to finish off this video I would throw out a challenge if you are a practitioner of Shasta Vidya or Kalari Piatu and you believe because you've been told that the British suppressed your martial art Show me the evidence. I'm completely happy to be proven wrong. And it's not even proven wrong because I'm not really saying I am right, I am wrong. I'm only saying what the evidence, what the history shows. And clearly, and I know people will say this, clearly I can't read uh, Indian sources on the matter. I can only read British sources on the matter. However, it's not like I'm reading propaganda sources. In most cases, I'm reading sources that are just diaries and autobiographies. And, uh, you know, and the overwhelming evidence that aspects of Indian swordsmanship crept into British swordsmanship practice. Um, so all of the evidence that I can see suggests that Indian swordsmanship was not only tolerated by the British government, but if anything was encouraged and glorified. 
and, uh, and, and spoken about and written about. So there we go guys, if you're aware of any kind of evidence that traditional Indian martial arts were suppressed by British authorities in India in the 19th century or some other time perhaps, maybe it was in the 20th century, then please share it with me because I'm very happy to see that. Cheers folks. Thank you for watching, please subscribe, follow us on Facebook, you can buy t-shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.